This is the first of three lectures on parental care in animals. Let's first address the question of how common is parental care in animals. And the fact is that parental care is, is quite rare in animals in general. And when it does exist, it should exist only when it can significantly increase the fitness of the parental individuals. And typically this occurs through increased survival of the young. Parental care probably has been best studied in birds, in which some degree of parental care is required in all species. But it also exists in other species like some amphibians, some teleost fishes, and even some insects. So let's look at the cost and benefit analysis of when you should see parental care and when parental care should not be seen. Well, there are substantial costs associated with parental care as associated with the investment of time and energy by potential parental individuals. This might limit the number of eggs a female could produce. From a male's perspective, this could be associated with lost extra matings. And for both male and female, parental care can sometimes, because of the stress associated with it, lead to a shortened lifespan. The benefits associated with increased survival of the young could come about through a variety of mechanisms. Reduced starvation of the young, better hatching success and developmental biology of the young, lower predation rate, and a variety of other mechanisms we'll discuss. When care does exist, the parental effort can vary depending on the ecological conditions. And some research on birds has indicated that there are different strategies associated with parental care in tropical species and those found in temperate northern zones. So if you first just look at the adult survival probability in these two regions, birds in the tropics tend to have much higher adult survivorship than uh, adults in the northern temperate zone. And this affects their uh, parental care decisions. If you look at the how they're going to minimize uh, risk in the tropics where the parents have the potential to live for a long period of time when threatened personally they want to minimize this risk to themselves. The northern birds because they have a relatively short lifespan they need to ma make sure they maximize their reproductive success each year and so they'll minimize the risk to their offspring even if it does put them at risk. So let's look at an experimental study that tested this in these two locations. First of all, if you look at the parental feeding rate in both the temperates and the tropics before a predator presentation experiment, you see that in the temperate zone and the tropics, we have comparable parental feeding rates. However, after a nest predator was presented, you see that the North American birds substantially reduced their feeding and the South American birds also reduce their feeding, but not to the degree as the temperate zone birds did. And the interpretation here is that the temperate zone birds are reducing substantially their parental feeding because they don't want to draw this potential nest predator to the location of their nest. And so they're going to slow down the feeding rate until this potential nest predator leaves the area. Now in a similar study, where they present an adult predator, something that would be potentially dangerous to the adult individuals, you see a different outcome. Again, before the predator presentation, we can establish the basic feeding rate uh, by the parents. Both is high in both the temperate zone species and the tropical species. However, after the presentation of the adult predator, we see that the North American birds, while they do decrease their parental feeding rate, they don't drop it nearly as much as the South American birds do. Again, the South American birds are going to want to minimize any potential threat to themselves. And this predator of an adult bird definitely represents that type of threat. So they want to minimize their, their risk so they can basically all but shut down their parental feeding rate until they feel that this threat is passed. However, the North American birds aren't nearly as willing to do this because they're not going to live very long anyway. And if they let this nest uh, fail, then there's no guarantee that they're going to have additional opportunities in the future. So when parental care does occur, 
who should be responsible for parental care when only one parent is needed. So we're talking about uniparental care here, and when uniparental care exists, should it be the female that provides the care or the male? Well, the typical pattern seen in the animal kingdom is that when uniparental care exists, it's typically associated with female care. And there are a variety of explanations that have been put forth to try to explain why it is the female that provides uniparental care. One idea is that the females already have more invested in the young. This uh, goes back to our argument we made with anisogamy. Eggs represent this huge investment that if parental care is needed, because of this big initial investment that the females have, they're more likely to be the individuals providing the care. Another argument is that females may have fewer benefits associated with not caring. This is basically the argument that males, because they gain with additional matings, any parental care may limit their ability to gain additional matings, and so they would have a huge cost associated with this. The females, well, not really that much of a cost under many circumstances, and so um, they're more willing to take this care role. Additionally, females may be more sure of the maternity. They uh, understand that they are related to the young. Males may not always be sure of the paternity, especially in cases with internal fertilization. Unless the male has been with the female constantly during her fertile period, there is the potential for extra percopulation. And so if there's any uncertainty there, you might expect the males to withhold parental care and the females to be the ones that provide this uniform parental care. And again, this is intuitive, but parental care might still be beneficial under certain circumstances if the following conditions are met. If the male has at least some paternity associated with the nest or the clutch, the reproductive effort, if the male has low probability of, of additional matings, meaning the cost of his parental care are greatly reduced, and if male care significantly does increase the survival of the young. So let's work through an example of that to demonstrate in circumstances where the males may want to provide care. Let's say that a male has paternity in 50% of the eggs for each mating, and that each mating uh, is associated with a production of 10 eggs by a female. Now, in circumstances where the male provides a paternal care, Let's say that means that the male can only mate one time, but he produces 60% survival of the young. Well, 10 eggs times 50% paternity, which we established initially, times 60% survival would lead to the production of three surviving offspring. Under the conditions of no care, Let's say that he can significantly increase the number of times that he mates, five times, he mates uh, five times as opposed to just one time, but the young survival drops drastically from 60% to 10%. Again, doing the math, 50 eggs in this case, again associated with 50% paternity in each case, but reduced to 10% survival, would lead on average to 2.5 young surviving with this strategy. So as you can see, the, the male, despite having mixed paternity associated with his, his reproductive efforts, in some cases it still would pay to have um, uh, per, be providing the paternal care. Another argument that's been put forth to try to explain why it's typically female uniparental care is that females have the closest association with the young while they're developing. This is, would be especially true with internal fertilization in which the young are actually developing inside the female or the female um, cannot lay the eggs uh, until fertilization has taken place. In these circumstances, males just have very limited potential to provide care in the earliest phases. And again, they, in many cases, are more likely going to be better off with additional matings. And so they can basically abandon the site and leave the female with providing the care. Now there are some, one big exception to this, in many fish species the females will lay eggs into male territories and, and once the eggs are in those territories then the male has the greatest association with the young and in those circumstances they tend to provide that uh, uniparental care. 
So this leads into this last point, leads into uh, a discussion of the effect of the fertilization pattern. So in species with uniparental care, if you have internal fertilization, the male basically can leave before the young are produced, and this basically leaves the female holding the bag, and in these circumstances we would expect female-only care. Uh, an example of that is seen in hummingbirds. Uh, male and female mate, the female days later will lay the eggs and provide all the care to the young. With external fertilization, females can lay eggs and then immediately leave and then as the male uh, approaches to shed sperm onto these eggs because he's the the last one there he may be left holding the bag uh, in which case male only care would be expected and many fish species show this pattern so let's look at some of the, the data that do support this relationship of the different fertilization patterns and, and who will provide the care. This, these are data from uh, parental care patterns looking across fish and amphibian families. And if you see, if you look within families with internal fertilization, you see by far the biggest percentage, 86% of these families is associated with situations where the female is providing the care and it's rarely with internal fertilization that the male provides the care. However, if you look at circumstances of external fertilization, the bulk of these circumstances show males providing the uniparental care with 70% of the cases, and it's relatively rare for the females to provide the care in cases of external fertilization. So these data do support the idea of the link between internal and external fertilization and which sex provides uniparental care. There are some problems with these data though in other fish species where there's simultaneous release there's actually much greater probability of paternal care than you'd expect. So 36 out of 46 cases you see paternal care not the 23 out of 46 or 50 percent uh, you would expect if it was just random. Uh, given that there's simultaneous release, uh, you would expect it would be randomly distributed between the males and females, but there's a bias toward male care. And in some frog species, the males actually deposit sperm before the eggs are laid, and in these species, the males provide the care as well. These could be the cases where the males are defending territories in which the egg deposition takes place, and so this greater association with the young in the territory predisposes male care. Let's revisit one of the assumptions we made early on about the cost associated with parental care. Is paternal care always costly? Again, how it would be costly to males is if it reduced their potential for additional matings. And for most species, yes, this is the case, that it does limit the number of potential matings if males are stuck to one spot providing parental care. But it may actually be the opposite in some fish. Eggs in the nest may actually attract additional females to lay additional eggs in these nests. And so territories with some eggs in them already will increase the probability that additional females will come in and deposit their eggs. So p paternal care in this situation is actually beneficial to males by increasing their probability of additional matings. And this has been studied with sticklebacks. For female fish, sometimes maternal care is significantly more costly than it is to males. If this significantly reduces their feeding rate and reduces their growth rate, this can decrease the likelihood of them producing eggs in the future. Small females produce many fewer eggs in many fish. So we see a fitness increase with size faster with increasing size in females than in males, as you can see from this figure here. So this puts a, a higher relative cost in some fish for maternal care, which might predispose male care. An example of this is seen in St. Peter's fish. These are mouth brooding cichlids. So both males and females can care for the young as they incubate them in their mouths. And this really has very little impact on male fitness. Non-brooding males show very little increases in fitness compared to brooding males. 
but non-brooding females can eat much more, and this allows them to produce uh, more and larger clutches in the future. So there's a higher cost for females to care for the eggs, given relatively low cost to the males. Uh, the males provide the care in these circumstances. And this makes sense. If you're brooding the young in your mouth and feeding is uh, very important for females, that would make sense that this would be very costly to females. And these are data ba to basically show that if you look at the interspawn interval, there's a huge difference between parental females and non-parental females. The non-parental females are females that can uh, forage more, acquire the resources to lay more eggs sooner. Let's look at parental care in water bugs. In uh, water bugs, it's paternal care that is provided. The males provide all of the uh, parental care. They basically carry around the eggs on their backs. These eggs are very large, and this is due to selection for uh, faster attainment of large uh, adult size. But large eggs have problems with gas exchange. As something egg shape increases in size, the volume increases at a much faster rate than the surface area. And so the transfer of oxygen and CO2 across the egg membrane is greatly slowed down as the eggs get bigger and bigger. So there's just a physical limitation there. And gas exchange is actually a lot easier to do in the air than in water. Water has actually much lower concentration of dissolved oxygen and then oxygen in the air. So laying the eggs, large eggs, in the terrestrial environment would seem to be a good solution to this. The problem is, once the eggs dry out, they become desiccated, they can no longer exchange gases. So the solution for this was back brooding by the males. Putting these large eggs onto the backs allows the male to spend a lot of time out in the terrestrial environment so that these large eggs can get uh, enough oxygen. But as they start to dry out, they go for a swim with the eggs to keep them moist. But again, females could do this. So why is it that males and not females that do this back brooding? Again, it's a similar uh, argument that we've made before. Males uh, have relatively low costs associated with this because they can mate again. In fact, males with eggs are more attractive to subsequent females, and so it may actually increase their mating success. Females, on the other hand, incur a much higher cost associated with back brooding. They don't want to spend a lot of time out in the terrestrial environment. They need to be in the water feeding so that they can sequester the resources for the production of additional broods. And if you look at the distribution of back brooding across water bugs, you see that just one family, the Bellostomatidae, shows this behavior and it apparently has evolved in a single instant, uh, either in this location or this location. Now the uncertainty here is due to the fact that this one species, we're just not sure what the behavior is. Regardless, it appears that this behavior has occurred only once, and this kind of shows in some cases the limitations of comparative methods. This appears to be a very adaptive strategy seen in these different species, but it's evolved only once, and we can't really make any generalizations about the evolution of this uh, behavior because it's only evolved one time. Our sample size is just one. Now, there are some circumstances we just discussed in which parental care has low or no cost and may actually be advantageous. But in most cases, parental care is costly, uh, time and energy, and uh, can reduce the lifespan of the parental individuals. So in these circumstances, where there's the potential for mixed parentage, how can individuals be sure to care for their own young and not for someone else's young? So let's look at an example of, of how this might be an issue in a colonial species of bat, Mexican free-tailed bats, in which millions of females and young will occupy the same cave. Pups are left in aggregations called creches, up to 4,000 individuals per square meter while the mothers go out foraging each night. And molecular analysis show that the females will typically nurse their own young. And how they locate their own young is through vocal and olfactory communication. 
So they basically looked at the genetics of the mother and the, the offspring to, to figure out who was related to who, looked at the patterns of, of who is feeding who, and looked at the variation in vocal communication and the smells of different pups to see that these are two mechanisms by which the pups can uh, indicate their kinship to their mothers. Well, this leads to a general prediction. Colonial species should have greater offspring recognition skills than solitary species. Solitary species, you just, you know, you leave your young, you come back to, to feed them, and they're just at the only nest in the area, as opposed to colonial species in which you come back to this aggregation of young, and it could be difficult to figure out which young is, is yours. And in colonial species, we talked about previously, there tends to be higher rates of extra parafertilization. So there's more potential that you could feed the wrong young. So a test of this prediction, if you compare uh, what's happening in bank swallows, which are colonial, you see that the young do give these very uh, d family distinctive vocalizations so that their parents can recognize uh, who they're related to and who they're not related to. And the parents, sh sure enough, feed only their young after cross-fostering experiments. So cross-fostering experiments mean if you take an individual from this nest and you move these individuals over to the neighboring nest and then make the reciprocal translocation where you take the individuals from this nest and move them back to the original nest, you then look at the feeding behavior of the parents. Do they go to their original nest and end up feeding young that are not theirs or do they move to another nest location to find their own young and feed their own young? And In the case of bank swallows, they do locate their own young based on the vocalizations. If you look at a closely related species, the northern rough-winged swallows, which are typically solitary, is sometimes found in small colonies, they are non-discriminant. When there's cross-fostering experiments conducted, they'll just feed whoever happens to be in their nest uh, if they're unrelated northern rough-winged swallows, or they'll even feed bank swallows. So again, in this situation, the colonial species, ha there has been selection pressure to make sure that you feed only offspring that are yours because there is a great potential to feed the wrong offspring. In solitary species, this really is just never that much of an issue, and so we don't see the evolution of uh, signals that would allow for discrimination. Here's another test of the prediction comparing barn swallows and cliff swallows. Barn swallows, again, are less social. Cliff swallows are, exist in these large colonies. And if you look at the vocalizations, cliff swallows first have much more complex vocalizations, and there's greater variation across family groups. Uh, these calls are much more variable, and this allows the cliff swallows uh, to uh, have better discriminatory abilities uh, and you do not see the same thing in the barn swallows or not to the same degree. Okay so we just talked about the fact that you know if you there's the potential to feed the wrong young you probably want to try to figure out a way just to take care for your own. But again let's challenge that assumption that care is costly. Sometimes individuals do care for genetic strangers and sometimes it's beneficial to do so. So these ducks are golden eye, and golden eye do benefit by stealing the young from other groups to mix in a few unrelated individuals with their own offspring. This is beneficial because there's actually very little cost associated with parental care in the first place. The parental care is pretty minimal. They basically just kind of herd their ducklings together. They don't actually feed them. These are precocial young, so they're pretty good to take care of themselves. But by keeping them in a group, your young can benefit from the dilution effect if you surround them by genetically unrelated individuals. Predators will attack these groups, and if the predator is successful, by combining your young with unrelated young, there's a greater potential that the young that are killed by the predator are not your own offspring. Another case in which caring for young that are not yours may be beneficial, in fathead minnows, males take over and care for the nests of other males. They take over their territories. 
And the reason for this is nests with eggs, again, are attractive to females. It increases the likelihood of, of attracting additional females that these new territory owners can mate with. And the owners will actually eat many of the eggs from the previous uh, male's territory and keep just enough so that they'll be attracted to females. And finally, another circumstance in which you might want to not sh be too discriminant of, of who you provide parental care to, perhaps in certain circumstances there would be strong selection against making a wrong choice and failing to feed your own young. In other words, if it's a very rare circumstance in which the young that you're feeding are not yours, and most of the time when you're feeding young, they are yours, if you're ever going to withhold care, the greatest probability is you're withholding care from your own young. So in that situation, it's better to make a mistake, feed the wrong young, if these young are typically going to be yours, and for them to be unrelated is a very rare event. So, for example, male birds might feed all the young at a nest, even if one of them might not be his due to extra pair fertilization, if extra pair fertilization is a relatively rare event. And this is, a, of course, assuming he can't distinguish among them, and that is exactly what you would expect in circumstances where this is fairly rare. In colonial species, you would expect much higher rates of extra pair fertilization, and that's when you would start to see an expectation of kin recognition evolving, and in which cases you might see greater discrimination abilities and more likely to discriminate between young that are yours and not yours. So in review, parental care is relatively rare in the animal kingdom, and the benefits to offspring survival have to outweigh the costs. Costs include the time and energy it takes to provide parental care, which could limit egg production in females or limit the number of matings with females for males. And in both male and female, there could be a decreased lifespan for the parents. Now, when you do see uniparental care, typically that's female care. And this could be due to the greater initial investment females have the fact that sometimes care is less costly for the females compared to what it is for males. Females oftentimes have a greater assurance of maternity than males have assurance of paternity, especially with internal fertilization. And there might be a typical closer association with the developing young with the female and not the male. And I have a question mark associated with this because it really depends on the pattern of fertilization. And that's when we talked about the fertility pattern, how that can provide an expectation of who will provide uh, uniparental care. With internal fertilization, this predisposes females to care. With external fertilization, it predisposes males to care. And since male is typically costly, individuals should feed their own young. And this would select for kin recognition in situations where mistakes are most likely, in situations of colonial breeding, in which offspring are in creches or in situations where colonial breeding is associated with higher rates of extra pair fertilization. But this assumption that care is costly may not always be the case. Male care may actually attract additional females when eggs are laid into territories. Caring for mixed broods may actually reduce predation threats to your own young and this would be beneficial especially if the parental care itself is, is not very elaborate and not very costly. And there could be situations where selective care could be maladaptive if it might lead to you mistakenly withholding care from your own young. So if the probability of having mixed broods is relatively rare, there's not going to be selection for discrimination because that would be uh, overly costly.